Coming up on this week's show, Brandilyn discusses the inclusive work of author Rick Reardon, and we talk about the Tom of Finland biopic. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knaus. Welcome, everyone, to episode 126 of Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from JeffAdamsWrites.com. And I'm Will from WillKnaus.com. This week's episode is brought to you in part by listeners just like you. We will have more information on how you can help support the show in just a few moments. Welcome back, everyone. Another week, another episode. Uh, we hope you had a wonderful week full of lots of reading, mm -hmm. lots of great books. Uh, we had an interesting week. It was less interesting than the prior weekend was, but it was interesting nonetheless. We recovered from the previous weekend, I think, most of this week. Yeah, we're still uh, getting ready for the big move. Yes, uh, we just a week a, away. We bought a new car, <laughs> uh, which wasn't in the plan, but we did it anyway. And um, Which turned out to be a good thing, I think. Yeah, it, it, worked, it all works out in the end. Yes, that <laughs> it does. <laughs> but yeah, we're a, a week away from the big move. We're prepping for that on the podcast this week, because we're going to do a big three-episode back-to-back recording. So that uh, you have episodes while we're packing up and hauling all of our stuff away. And then resetting it all back up. So, yes, so yeah. no need to worry, folks. While we're busy, we are still going to be giving you wonderful, new, fresh content every single week. That was my fresh noise. Uh, yeah, okay then. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, we woke up to some fun news this morning from some friends of the podcast, uh, RJ Scott and VL Losey have announced that they are introducing a brand new serial, which is kind of exciting. Uh, Pucks and Percentages uh, dropped just this very Sunday morning, March 4th. Uh, this is going to be a story between a statistician who goes to work for The Rush, which is the AHL feeder team for the Harrisburg Railers, which of course is VL and RJ's uh, primary hockey series that they've got out there. And uh, the Rush alternate captain, Nick Tenzinski, I love the names he's got, these two come up with. Um, Tenzinski, Tenzinski is a perfect hockey name, if ever there was one. Anyway, this is a free hockey romance serial that will drop new installments each Sunday. You can get yours at mmhockeyromance.com. I certainly have downloaded mine already this morning, because I have to keep up with that stuff. And kudos to them for launching out another spinoff of the uh, Railer series. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Audible Romance Package, shall we? Mm -hmm. So this past week, uh, authors who have... Before you go explaining, tell everyone what the Audible Romance Package is. So the Audible Romance Package was introduced back in November and is essentially uh, Kindle Unlimited for audiobooks. For a monthly fee, listeners can devour as many... Uh, audiobooks in the romance package as they choose. And when it first came out, uh, Audible got in touch with authors and said, hey, you could put these books into the package if you want, and if you put them in, they're in for seven years, which is the typical length, I believe, of the ACX uh, mm -hmm. exclusivity contract. Uh, this week, uh, authors got their first royalty reports, and it's pretty fair to say that it sent a resounding shockwave through uh, the industry. Uh, it was revealed that the romance package is paying authors around a tenth of a cent per minute listened to. And that would turn out, if you listen to a ten-minute book, that the author got about... You mean ten hour? Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. My words are faltering I'm, this morning. I'm here to correct you. <laughs> a ten-hour <laughs> book would net an author approximately 57 cents. Uh, and, you, and that's opposed to getting a cut of about... I think the Audible world is about 35% on a $30 retail price or the $15 credit price. That's a huge discrepancy uh, in, in what you would get between a book in the program and out. Uh, and you can compare that to Kindle Unlimited, which pays about a half a cent per page read. This is utterly ridiculous. If you consider that an author can pay, let's take that 10-hour book and use the 
pretty common price of $300 per finished hour. You're going to pay about $3,000 to get your audiobook produced. And to get 57 cents back on that 10 hour read is preposterous. Um, a lot of outcry happened, a lot of authors trying to get their books out, Audible letting some out uh, from what I've seen uh, on Facebook and some other places. And later in the week, Audible uh, came in with an email to authors saying that they're reviewing the situation and looking to perhaps pay out some bonuses to kind of ease the pain a little bit. Uh, but yeah, it's that seems too little too late because um, it, it, it would take a lot to make up for uh, getting 57 cents for a 10 hour book. Um, I have one book in the program. Um, it's an older title. I may, I may look at pulling it out myself because I have issues with other aspects of the program and how they've labeled my book is on the steamier side when it is a YA book that has no, there's no sex even mentioned in the book. There's a little bit of making out, but their algorithm got it crazily wrong in its in its uh, heat ranking. So, I don't know. What's your take on this? I would term it a clusterfuck. Um, and there's the explicit tag for this episode. <laughs> um, this is so bad, it doesn't even... There really are no words. This was... Um, we don't usually go into um, behind-the-scenes author stuff, because that's not what this show is about. There are a whole lot of other podcasts that can, you know, dig down into the nitty gritty of what publishing and writing is all about. Um, this is monumentally unacceptable um, for an author, especially an independent author, to get an audio book done. Jeff, as Jeff mentioned, it, uh, it's a substantial investment mm -hmm. uh, for anyone who does that. And for Audible to... Um, initiate this program with really no thought at all to the payout structure. This is, um, like I said, I yeah, I can't even come up with words right now. Yeah, it's so incredibly bad. So I don't normally tell you what to do or what to think, but if you are a reader who loves and appreciates your authors and happens to be a part of this program, I would suggest you quit immediately because you know what? Audible and Amazon are ripping authors off. And it's going to take quite a long time for the dust to settle and for them to figure out how to make this program work. Right now, as of this moment, the program is not working in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um, so, if you're a reader, get out of that program immediately. Uh, if you're a writer, do not, under any circumstances, do not pass go. Do not, <laughs> do not even consider getting into this program. It's bad. Yeah, and we should say too that the authors did not know what they were getting into. I think we all we all understood that this was going to be a KU for Audible, but we no one knew what the payout was going to be. No one knew that it was going to be this bad. Um, and it is possible on KU, if your book is long enough, to to make your money back and potentially do really well with the page read uh, count. But it's there's no way to make this good. And Will's right. We don't often tell you what to think um, because we know people's dollar you know, needs to be stretched to get what they want. But this is a case where authors are really being damaged by this. And... and the, the end result would be that if, if this was the only way to get a book done, I don't think they would be doing audiobooks because they would never, ever get the payback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay, rant over now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. Let's do that. <laughs> um, we have no new patrons to thank this week, uh, but I'll go through my normal spiel anyway. Because we would love to welcome some new ones, perhaps, when we get back from our our, our moving time. Exactly. So guys, remember, you can always help support the podcast by joining us through Patreon. For as little as 25 cents an episode, your pledge helps pay the cost of producing and distributing this show. And for fans who pledge at the silver and gold levels, you'll have the exclusive opportunity to ask questions of upcoming guests. Also, any month that we have pledges that cover our monthly production costs, which has actually happened to have been every single month that we have uh, uh, done uh, Patreon, 
Thank you so much for that. Uh, for That's every awesome. single month that we uh, meet our goals, we will produce a very special bonus episode. Uh, especially for those people who join us on the platform. Now, you can get more information upon uh, how to join, uh, how to help, and all the groovy bonus episodes that are available. Uh, all you have to do is go to patreon.com uh, slash big, 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 big. Oh, I almost got through the whole thing. You almost did. A little, little bit. Let me try that again. All you have to do is go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash biggayfictionpodcast. In the hockey player's heart, the feel-good gay romance by Jeff Adams and Will Knauss, hockey star Caleb Carter returns to his hometown to recover from an injury. He never expects to run into his one-time crush at a grade school fundraiser. Seeing Aaron Price hits him hard, like being checked into the boards. The attraction is still there, even after all these years, and Caleb decides to make a play for the school teacher. You miss 100% of the shots you never take, right? Aaron has been burned by love before, and can't imagine what a celebrity like Caleb could possibly see in a guy like him. Their differences are just too great. But as Aaron spends more time with Caleb, he begins to wonder if he might have what it takes to win the hockey player's heart. Get The Hockey Player's Heart at DreamSpinnerPress.com, Amazon.com, and other online book retailers. So even while we've been getting ready for the big move, we've still been reading and watching cool stuff, and you have a, a DreamSpun desire to tell us about. Yes, I do. I actually read uh, two books this week. I'm going to be talking about the first one, um, uh, incidentally, this is another case of, uh, I picked two books at random, and they actually ended up being incredibly similar. For example, here is book number one. It's got a handsome guy with a beard, he's wearing a dark blue suit, and his arms are crossed because he's a serious billionaire type. Here's book two. It has a handsome guy, he's got a beard, he's wearing a dark blue suit, and... Yes, that's right. His arms are crossed because he is a serious billionaire. Um, I'm going to talk about the first one. Despite those similarities, the books are, of course, very different because that is how romance works. Okay, the first book is The Bunny and the Billionaire by Louisa Masters. Okay, this particular story is about Ben. Uh, he is a nurse from Australia, and he is on a whirlwind trip of Europe. Uh, he uh, was taking care of, uh, uh, um, I can't think of the word right now, someone who is, uh, well, essentially in hospice. He was taking care of someone okay. for an extended period of time, and when uh, she passed away, she uh, gave him a substantial amount of money. And she uh, talked to him all the time about traveling the world and all the places that she visited. So uh, he decided... Uh, with the money that he received, he was going to travel the world in her honor and visit oh. some of the places that he talked about. So Ben, our nice guy nurse, uh, is in Monaco. Beautiful, glamorous Monaco. Uh, and um, a very handsome guy catches his eye, so he follows him into one of the casinos. Uh, that guy is Leo. He is the <laughs> rich playboy billionaire of the title. And... Um, uh, there are, there are sparks, certainly, from the very first moment that they meet. Um, both of them are very uh, charming, and it's uh, very, very funny. Um, I like the relationship between these two of them. I mean, from the very, very get-go, um, there were, you know, there's definite chemistry mm -hmm. between the two of them. Um, and as they start to spend more and more time together... Um, and uh, experience all that, you know, Monaco has to offer, um, Ben sort of learns how to use some of his newfound wealth, uh, while at the same time kind of uh, learning how the other half lives. I thought what was interesting about this particular book is it's not a billionaire book in the traditional sense, um, when I think of, like, billionaire CEOs, I think of Harlequin Presents, and it's, you know, a hard as nails, you know, alpha male, and the, the nice spunky gal who teaches him how to love. 
Um, ben is a spunky guy, and he teaches Leo how to love, but I think this particular story is really more kind of uh, a fish-out-of-water story. Mm. Uh, ben is a little bit of a awkward um, goofball, <laughs> and he sort of stumbles his way through all these uh, uh, glamorous situations. Um, especially, uh, there's a moment where Leo takes Ben to meet his parents. Um, Leo, uh, his father is a French business magnate, and his mother is literally, um, uh, a Saudi princess. <laughs> so not only is he vastly wealthy, he has royalty in his background, uh, just to give you an idea of what's going on in this story. Um, really quick, I want to mention, uh, some of the secondary characters are really terrific. Um, not only did I love Ben and Leo, I really enjoyed Danny, which is Ben's best friend. She is, uh, of course, back in Australia, and they have phone calls back and forth. Um, they're incredibly funny. Um, every day Ben essentially calls Australia and, and tells her what he's been doing during the day. And, um, she keeps going, OMG. And she, she, <laughs> she looks stuff up on Google to make sure that Ben uh, realizes, you know, some of the outrageous, you know, crazy wealthy stuff that he's getting to do. Because Ben is a little bit, you know, adorably clueless when it comes to some of these things. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, as the weeks turn into months, they of course fall for one another. And I think, um, what's nice about this book is there's no real, uh, angst or conflict. If you're looking for a really complicated plot, uh, guys, this is not the book for you. It's really pretty simple and straightforward. The, the only thing that's really standing in the way of uh, Ben and Leo's happiness is themselves. Um, there's even a point uh, after they've spent uh, an incredible amount of time together that um, Ben continues on his European tour and he goes off to Italy. And he's like, you know what? If this whole relationship thing between us is real, um, time apart won't ruin it. Mm. So uh, he ends up uh, coming back, and they live happily ever after. Of course they do. So I really... Oh, by the way, before I, before I wrap this up and recommend this book, um, the bunny of the title is a nickname for Ben. Uh, Leo's cousin uh, nick nicknames him Bunny from the like, first moment he sees him. Because oh. he's kind of adorable and fluffy and kind of... It's a cute... It's a, yeah, it's a pet name kind of a thing. Um, because when, when I first got this book, I'm like, what the fuck has bunnies got to do with, I was like, what? <laughs> and, and then you don't explain it on the back blurb either. I was like, but no, it's a cute little nickname. So I highly recommend The Bunny and the Billionaire by Louisa Masters. I liked it an awful lot. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's really good. That sounds fun. Uh, we've also recently watched, uh, the Tom of Finland biopic. Uh, this was kind of revelatory to me. Um, because I had no clue of the backstory uh, for this amazing artist. Mm -hmm. Tom of Finland is a Finnish film, of course, that came out last year in 2017. Uh, it's the story of Toko Lassonen, who, of course, would become famous as the artist Tom of Finland. And it's a pretty straightforward biopic, as it follows his life linearly uh, from just after World War II, uh, he comes back home to Finland, and he has a very difficult time readjusting to, you know, you know civilian life. Um, he's uh, stressed out by his time in the war, uh, and he's really struggling to find his place, um, not only as a gay man, but as an artist. Um, uh, eventually, he finds work at an ad agency, uh, he, while he works there at day, he uh, cruises parks at night. Um, it was We're talking about the 1950s in Finland. Uh, it was an incredibly difficult and repressive time. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of Tom's uh, pain in that period comes from, because he's really trying to come to terms with... Um, just what's going on. It was, it was really 
bad. <laughs> it was a very bad time for everyone. Um, uh, what I really enjoyed, one of the many things I really enjoyed about this film, is how it presented the creative process. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time when we get biopics about artists, whether it's like a painter or a writer um, or, a, you know, a, a singer or whatever, um, usually uh, nine times out of ten, at some point in the movie, you're going to get a montage, <laughs> a montage of creativity. So if they're a writer, that means they're pecking away on the typewriter and they're, you know, ripping pages out and crumpling it up and throwing it next to the wastebasket. <laughs> or if it's a singer, they're out pounding the pavement and, you know, trying to get into, you know, get their demo done or they're singing in front of a microphone holding their their hand over the the earpiece <laughs> um that sort of thing uh, it's very hard to visually represent creativity yeah. what i think this movie done, did uh, exceptionally well is is that it really got the point across that there is no for tom anyway there was no real um, line between him and his art. Um, he was his art and his art was him. Ve almost every single moment throughout the film, he's like sketching something or, uh, or actually, <laughs> or holding a cigarette. Yeah, true. <laughs> every, everyone in this movie smokes like a chimney, which was <laughs> utterly hilarious. So he's either holding a pencil or a cigarette or sometimes both at the same time. Um, so he's constantly sketching and working on his art uh eventually tom finds a way to uh put his art out into the world uh he sends it to bob meisner at amg in america and that's really kind of where his uh, career took off um he was known pretty much almost all over the world except for his home country mm -hmm. uh he was um uh i yeah, I don't know. It, it's rem really remarkable. His art is incredibly distinctive. Even if you don't know who Tom of Finland is, if you saw one of his drawings, you would be like, oh yeah, that guy. Um, so I think this movie not only gives us some insight into who Tom was, but the importance of his art and what it meant to uh, the sexual revolution and gay liberation that mm -hmm. was going on at the time at the late 60s and early 70s. It was, um, he's a remarkable guy and he's, you know, incredibly important. Yeah, I was, like I said when we started talking about this, that it really was a revolution for me to... to revelation. Revelation, thank Let you. Let me correct you again. <laughs> um, because I've seen his work, of course, uh, on, on the AMG volumes that we've got, on... Mm -hmm. Countless, you know, pieces of just ephrem, eph, uh, ephrema, of Efe ephemera, ephemera. Yes, there's a ton of product um, uh, that features um, his artwork. Yes, uh, but now to find out, you know, his background a little bit, uh, how the war affected him, how uh, just how gay men were treated in the in his time frame, um, which is so very different. Uh, I think even from how it was in the U.S. in that time. Finland was even more conservative in that time. Repressive, uh, yeah. Repressive. It was, it was very difficult. Um, and how he got his artwork out there and how he saw how it impacted people, mm -hmm. um, not just with its original publication in, AM, in the AMG volumes and as it became more widely known here, but how it carried through also at, in the early days of AIDS, mm -hmm. uh, which is also portrayed in this film. Um the acting across the board was amazing. I felt like I was actually watching a documentary occasionally mm -hmm. uh, because of the care taken for it. And also interesting were the DVD extras that were present because it gives you an idea. As you mentioned, he wasn't really celebrated in his country in his time, mm -hmm. but he has become now uh, a, a big deal in Finland. Mm -hmm. Um that to the degree that I that the film board kind of you know funded part of this film. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. to put it out there. Um, so yeah, an an amazing biopic and and highly worthwhile to to pick up uh, either on DVD. I don't know if it's streaming anywhere right now or not. Um, but yeah, look for it. The Tom of Finland uh, biopic.
Did you know that podcasts love to get reviews too? Taking a moment to leave a review about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast helps us with the show's visibility online. Please take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a review. Your comments help other readers of gay romance discover this show. Thanks for helping us spread the word about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. So not too long ago, you had the chance to sit down with our good friend, Brandilyn. Yes. Uh, we had actually planned this conversation back the last time we saw her at the end of last year. Uh, she, as, as you may know from some of her talk on the show, uh, is doing a lot of work in her children's uh, school library right now. And she has really fallen into the work of Rick Rudin, who is probably best known uh, for the Percy Jackson series that... Um, was, uh, I think a couple films have been made off those books, and I had no idea that the series was as ginormous as it is. Uh, Percy, I think, is a five-book series on its own, but then there are many uh, series that have spun off of that. Mm -hmm. So now it's like five series and some 20 books that lurk in here, and I had no idea how inclusive Rick was with his uh, characters and including the entire LGBTQ spectrum in them. And Brandilyn wanted to talk about that, so of course we were more than happy to do so. I'm very happy to welcome back to the podcast, Brandilyn. Hello, how are you? I'm awake. You're awake, which is good. <laughs> I'm awake and I'm not sick anymore, so... That's even better. Um, yeah. So I know from when we were talking back in December, we were talking about, uh, off-camera a little bit, books of Rick Reardon's. And we wanted yeah. to talk about those this month. So give us all yes. the download on Rick Reardon. Okay, so I spend a lot of time working in my middle schooler's library. And so I kind of got on a middle grade young adult kick last, last part of last year. And one of the series that is very popular that I read and just absolutely fell in love with it's actually five different series. Um, it's the, it's, they're all by Rick Raritan. Um, they start with uh, Percy Jackson and the Hero of the... Yeah, Percy Jackson, and then the Kane Chronicles, um, the Heroes of Olympus, Magnus Chase, and Trials of Apollo. Those are the five. They actually kind of go in that order um, Magnus Chase and Trials of Apollo kind of parallel each other. Each one takes a look at different mythologies, um, Greek, Roman, uh, Egyptian, Norse. Well, then Trials of Apollo goes back to Greek and Roman, obviously. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk about it here on the podcast is his treatment of LGBT characters. Because from very early on in the Percy Jackson books, there is a side character that you get the impression that he's gay. By the end of the Percy Jackson books, it comes out that, yes, he is. And he's had a crush on Percy this whole time. Percy is not gay. Percy's straight. But he doesn't have the, his reaction to the revelation was priceless. It was just it was a non-reaction. It was a, oh, that's nice, but, you know, I'm kind of in it, into Annabeth. And then as, this, as he goes through the various series, you get LGBTQI characters popping up, some in main roles, some not, but just the way he treats them, they are, it's, it's a part of their character but it's not the main part of their character. It's not a defining thing. It is part of them. It's run of the mill. It's normalized. He has a gender queer character in Magnus Chase. Obviously, he's got Apollo who is openly bi. He talks about his boyfriends as much as he talks about his past girlfriends. Um, and there are a few other side characters here and there, but if it's one of those... If you're not interested in LGBTI, you can still enjoy the series. They're beautifully written. They're, adventure, they're urban fantasy adventure based on mythology. You can actually, your kids can learn a lot. You can learn a lot. Um, plus, he, he's got a lot of side 
um, projects that talk more about the mythology. But just for me, the fact that if a kid is struggling with his ident- his or her identity, it's not out there saying you are queer, you are gay, you're, it's, this is normal. This is part of you, you know? And I think the, his treatment of the gender queer characters is very, very interesting because his main character has a crush on the gender queer character. And sometimes they're male. Sometimes they feel female. And as the series goes on, you see more and more the main character going, okay, I recognize that she's female today. I recognize that he's male. And he's very good with the pronouns and stuff on that. But again, it's, it's a, for that one, it's a little more over the top because in order to describe, because it's text, you know, you, 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 you have to mention it. But it's just, again, it's, it's normalized, which back when I was running prison, that was one of the things I always said, I want LGBTQI to be AI, blah, blah, to be normalized. I don't want my kids growing up in a world where if they do choose to love someone the same gender, or if they decide, or if they figure out, not decide, figure out that they're, the gender they were assigned at birth is wrong, or whatever, I don't want it to be an issue. I want it to be normalized. Um, Just this past week, there was, with the Olympics, one of the downhill skiers at the end of his run, he kissed his boyfriend. And it was just a little peck on the the lips. But it's a part of normalizing it. The Mm -hmm. more people are exposed, the more, I mean, I live in a red state. I live in Texas. I live in Southeast Texas. I, I, I hear the bigotry all the time, but the more, but it, more and more, I'm also meeting people who have had their eyes opened because it is becoming more normalized. It is, they are seeing it over and over and going, oh, wait, it's just an aspect of their, of that. Just like I'm a brunette and my kids are all blonde. We were, ta- we were having that conversation yesterday. My kids are all blonde and I'm obviously not. It's just an aspect. I mean, they, I tease them about it. I'm like, you can't be my kids, blah, blah, blah. But you know, (laughs) I know how genetics works. Um, but I want it to be normalized. And that's what I loved about the Rick Riordan books. Besides the fact that they are awesome fantasy series, which you know, me and fantasy, Mm -hmm. just his treatment of the LGBTI character, LGBTQ, I can't even say it, QAI characters was just, to me, it was awesome because he normalized it. And and that's why we wanted, I wanted to talk, well, I was just, to, as you said, last uh, time we were on, afterwards we just started talking about what we were reading and you're like, yeah, let's talk about that. Because it is, it it's it's not in the quote unquote genre. It's mainstream, and they just happen to be gay characters. So, Rick Reardon, the entire series, they pop up here and there. Like I said, once you get into Trials of Apollo, it's the main character. Um, in Magnus Chase, it's a very, it's one of the much more important characters. But even in Heroes of Olympus, though he's a minor character, you see him with his boyfriend. And it's just as he goes along, and you can tell part of it is as he's writing these series, this is becoming more and more important of an issue. And so he is bringing it out more and more and normalizing it along the way. So, yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about this this month. I've got another fantasy, probably we'll talk about a completely different fantasy uh, novel next uh, time. But audiobook, of course. Of course. And for the audio files, the entire series is on audio. Um, It's not, some of the narrators are better than others, but I listen to the whole thing on audio because, you know, audio books are my thing. And so, yeah, the whole thing is on audio, available on Audible. And um, if you want the um, 
ebook versions, watch Amazon. They go on sale quite often because it is, you know, 25, well, 20 some odd books. Trials of Apollo and Magnus Chase are not done yet. The new ones of those should be out in the next few months. Um, but yeah, watch Amazon. They go on sale every few months if you want or, you know, borrow them from your library. And we do like yeah, borrowing can... from the library because the libraries are really good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, our library doesn't have much in the way of LGBTQ AI, which is why another reason I love that that's there because I can say, hey, go get those. And they're there. And they're in our middle school library. And I know for a fact that we're not going to have anything controversial <laughs> um, in our library because. Right. The parents would have a cow because I live in Hicksville, Red State, you know? Yeah. Um, there are plenty of parents who wouldn't, but there are some that would, and unfortunately they're the louder group where I live. Yeah. So it's good that these are out there um, for yeah. the kids, for sure. I, I like the books that uh, that normalize the characters that way. There's a young adult series um, by Alex London, um, the first book's called Proxy, um, that there's a an LGBTQ character in there. And it, it's like the least interesting thing about him, that he happens to be gay. Yeah. Uh, but he's also the hero of the book. So, I, I, I think I have that book. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, definitely check it out. It's really excellently done. I, I tend to pick up books when they look interesting and then you know they languish in my kindle <laughs> yeah i have that problem too <laughs> it's like yeah. oh that looks good that looks good let me get that need that and then yeah hey, it's only two dollars right now let's get that there's never enough time <laughs> yeah uh, i was just yeah i'm i'm currently um listening to uh harper fox's tick and i can never say that and frame series on audio which is actually a really good series as well. I've read it now. I'm just listening to the audio because interesting that you brought that up because Lisa from Novel Approach just talked about um, Harper Fox. Yeah, well, these are some of her older novellas. It's a paranormal mystery. It takes place in I don't know Scotland, something like that. One of those UK areas. I don't remember right off the top of my head. But she actually just put out a whole lot of hers on audio. Harper Fox did. So um, my favorite of hers is Salisbury Key, and it is on audio. I haven't listened to the audio because I read the ebook ages ago. And a lot of hers, if you happen to be in the romance package, uh, if you happen to have the romance package from Audible, a lot of Harper Foxes are in there. Oh, that's good I, to know. Yeah, I discovered that um, because I actually already own most of the LGBT titles that are in the romance package, except the Harper Fox ones um and our walker has a few i believe as well anyway um but yeah quite a few of harper foxes are in the romance package which is kind of like ku for audio but yeah. just romance titles so you know me audiobooks absolutely you are our audio correspondent <laughs> for the most part i think <laughs> i listen to way too many there's I no such thing as too many well, last I looked, I have about 1,900 audiobooks. That's still not too many. As long as you've got space room in the cloud, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, I just started re-listening to uh, Mary Calme's Marshall series. Excellent reread. Um, that's, what did I just, oh, and I just finished uh, Derek McLean's narration of Josh Landon's Point Blank. Um, series, which there's an older version of those books that the first four were narrated by someone else, but Derek McLean blows them out of the water. I, I have the older versions, but I will never listen to them again because <laughs> Derek McLean is just, he, he's, he's the absolute right voice for these characters. That's so, perfect. Anyway. I may need those because I'm a big fan of Derek's narration. So Yeah, it's, it's the pl Point Blank series. It's five novellas in one so it's one credit for five novellas. Nice. And, that's a good that's a good price ratio too. Yeah. So anyway. All right. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, especially for talking about the Rick Reardon stuff, because I think that's really good stuff to put out there. And hopefully some of the, the listeners should go check that out. I will probably go check some of them out, too, because I have not uh, visited Rick's universe. So I was lost in it for about a month. Oh, yeah, it probably took me about two and a half weeks to get through all of them. It's a good universe. All it's right. fun and it's exciting and it's representative. It's awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. We will see you again in a couple couple months. So thanks to Brandon for stopping by and probably putting 20 books instantly onto my TBR list because I think I will need to delve into those books. Not only do I love YA, but you know it harkens back to some of the fantasy stuff I used to read as a kid, and it, I think it'll be kind of fun to check those out. Awesome. So I think that'll do it for this week's episode. Yeah, I'm kind of giddy for next week's episode. Um, for episode 127, we've got Becky Albertalli here. Those of you who followed the podcast know that Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda is one of my most favorite books ever. And next week, Love, Simon, the adaptation of that book, hits movie screens. And uh, we've got Becky here to talk all about the movie, which is going to be super awesome. Fantastic. So, guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter if you have a book. So until next time, guys, keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and the complete episode backlist, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday on all major podcast distributors and YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.